William, thank you for joining our special conversation with Saur Energy Magazine. So first question is how the journey of Husk Power started. So it wasn't actually my journey uh, that I that was started. It was the journey of our co-founder and CEO Manoj Sinha, who's from Bihar. He grew up in a a, a community about seventy five kilometers outside of the state capital Patna, uh, called I think it's called Bihar Sharif, is where he's from originally. His family um, and he and a group of four or five others who are from India and also from that region started the Husk journey in two thousand and eight. So almost so more than fifteen years ago. And essentially, you know, at that time in India, this was before maybe you were born, I don't know. Uh, no, it wasn't. But, uh, you know, it was at that time, rural electrification was still a major issue in, in India. Uh, there were still huge swaths of the country that were unelectrified. The discoms hadn't reached much of the country, especially the rural areas. So Manoj, our CEO, and, and the co other co-founders decided that they would start Husk to essentially try and bring electricity to those communities that were under, unserved. Uh, and so that was the, net, the, gen, the genesis of Husk Power. Uh, originally, the concept was to use waste biomass. So that's a, Bihar is a, a large rice producing state. Uh, there's a lot of waste biomass that comes from the rice uh, harvest pr uh, process. They used gasifiers to turn that waste biomass into uh, synth 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 gas, and then they used that gas to power generators, generate electricity, and they strung lines and poles to the communities that they served. So that was the, that was the genesis, 2008. Fast forward another six years or so, um, uh, the government in India had already been pushing to extend the grid, there had been progress made there. And the, at the same time, solar prices came down considerably as well as storage. So 2014, there was a moment in time where the company realized that waste biomass, that solution for electrification, wasn't going to scale. Number one, because it couldn't provide 24-7 power to the communities that we were serving. Number two, it wasn't a viable business model for us. We weren't actually making money from that, and we needed to in order to be a sustainable business. So Manoj stepped in at that time. He took over as the CEO. There was an original founding CEO. Manoj came in at 2014, and he pivoted the business considerably. Uh, and since that time, so the last 10 years, Manoj is under his leadership. The company's uh, transitioned to primarily a solar plus battery mini grid operator. We build, own, and operate our mini grids. We typically put in a solar plant with batteries, and then we string five kilometer radius of, uh, of transmission poles and, 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 and lines. And, you know, um, so that, that's sort of how the business has evolved. The technology changed. Our business model has also evolved as well. Besides just selling electricity, we had to add additional components to that business, right? You don't, what we learned was you can't just expect to put a generation asset and transmission and distribution lines into a community and expect people to use that electricity, right? These are communities that didn't really have access to electricity. You also had to think about how do we um, create demand on those mini grids in order to make the mini grid viable, right? So we have added uh, appliance sales and financing into our business model. We've uh, taken the strong EPC capacity that we have in-house from having built mini grids for so many years, and we apply that to rural CNI, commercial and industrial. Uh, and then we are also uh, scaling a number of different energy services, right, around agro-processing hubs. We're looking at e-mobility. We've test, we've tried uh, water as a service as well that also uses the mini grid electricity. So it's a, it's a, an evolution that's happened over the past five years, both in terms of technology, business model. That started by by, by Manoj, and now you know we've been able to achieve. Uh, profitability here in India, and then taken our learnings from India and exported them to uh, Africa as well. So it's been a, I would say, a long and arduous journey, not without many uh, uh, growing pains. Um, and that was all actually captured in a Harvard Business School case study about uh, Manoj and how he made that transition. It's quite a, a fascinating tale. So you you have operations in uh, sub-Saharan countries and India too. So how was your experience with sub-Saharan countries and how your journey there and in India are different? 
So the markets are very different. Um, you know, I think the one uniform uh, element to both India and to the countries where we operate in Africa is that there has to be a, a, a strong regulatory and policy framework in place. Without that framework, it's impossible to invest the, I mean, this is a capital intensive business, right? So you have to invest a fair amount of capital. You can't do that unless you have regulatory certainty. Uh, and you know some level of, of guarantee that you're not going to be ex exposed to too much political risk, right? So if the grid extends to where your mini grid is, are you are, are your interests <coughs> are your interest maintained? Uh, is there a fair price if you're absorbed into the grid? You know all of those things need to be covered by a regulatory framework. That's true in India. It's true in Africa, where the markets different uh, differ considerably is that um, you know India's Primarily for mini grids and under the grid market. Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, pardon me. So uh, where it's different is at the at the country level is that you know India is primarily what we call an under the grid market for mini grids. So we actually are building infrastructure, both the generation asset and the transmission and distribution, that's parallel to the grid, the national grid that the dis or the state discoms that are operating in our communities. So we're. You know, essentially filling in for the gap that's left by the discoms uh, in terms of uh, both reliable and quality electricity to rural communities. There's a lot of MSMEs in rural India who need 24-7 power that doesn't have any voltage fluctu fluctuation that's available 24 hours a day. They're not getting that from the discoms still. And so they're turning to diesel, which is very expensive. Um, and where Husk comes in is we can displace that diesel, provide us cost savings of, let's say, 30% or more to those MSMEs, and provide them with the reliability and quality of power that they need. So that's the India market's very specifically focused on MSMEs, whereas the Africa market, we're still largely off-grid, serving off-grid communities. And these are communities that never had access to grid electricity and probably won't for a, a, a lot longer period of time. And so, you know, India, let's say we're 80% uh, MSMEs, 20% other. In Sub-Saharan Africa, it's the, it's the opposite, right? It's 20% MSMEs, maybe 30%, 70% households, right? So uh, the customer mix is very different. Um, and so therefore, the use of the electricity is also quite different. But, you know, the behavior of the customer is quite, quite similar. So currently you have businesses, I think, in Bihar and in Uttar Pradesh. So how had been your experience with the communities in Bihar and uh, Uttar Pradesh? Can you cite some examples how your 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 intervention helped the MSME sectors there? Yeah, I mean, I think there are a lot of examples around MSMEs that we serve in UP and Bihar, right? Um, you know, we serve a, a lot of uh, furniture manufacturers, small factories, um, you know, bread making uh, <coughs> businesses that have, you know, a lot of energy use, you know, schools as well, government offices, banks is another area that we serve, uh, you know, uh, a lot of our customers are, are from the banking and financial services, you know, in terms of, um, let's say, furniture makers, right? There, I can think of one example where, you know, one of our customers had a small staff of three, four people, um, and they were making most of the furniture by hand uh, and didn't have good lighting in their, in their, in their workshop. Um, we were able to come in and through our appliance uh, sales and financing arm of the business, provide them with some uh, new machinery that could help them mechanize what they were doing and, and move away from manual labor to more mechanized labor. Uh, that allowed them to build a you know, considerably more number of pieces of furniture each month, uh, which increased their revenue, which allowed them to hire more people. So essentially what we did was we came in and, and helped them mechanize their business, grow their business, and reinvest whatever money they were making in addition to that by displacing diesel, by also, you know, making their operations more efficient, adding to their, their level of income. So that's the type of approach that we, we take, not only in India, but also in Africa, where we're really trying to be a, a catalyst for rural livelihoods and economic development. And we see that happening uh, with the MSME customers that we serve in India, but also with the customers that we're serving in Africa. 
So one good point you raised is like after your interventions, after your mini grids, a lot of people shunned using diesel and other polluting sources. And uh, maybe in those areas, there must be some erratic power supplies from the grid also. So but I believe that the power generated from uh, mini grids are costlier for the MSME sectors or the consumers. So how they got confidence of using mini grid power? I mean, look, so, you know, there, there's no... There's no, it's not rocket science, right? You compare us to grid electricity, we provide higher uptime, uh, our, no voltage fluctuation, um, and better service overall, right? Uh, they ha we have a customer-facing app, they can pay everything online, it's all digital. Ease, there's no friction between how we serve the customer uh, and what they get as a service, whereas there's a lot of friction with the, the discom still. Um, you know, and I think that you have to look at this as a sort of longer term as well. Uh, energy demand in India is only going to increase exponentially over the next decade. You know, I think I've seen ex of, uh, forecasts for a 3x growth at least between now and 2030. Heat stress on the grid is only going to increase. The need for grid resilience is, is much more important. The government has mandated that the, the percentage of renewables into the grid has to increase. So there are a lot of macro trends that are pointing towards a much greater need for decentralized renewable energy solutions like mini grids in India, but also globally. And I think that trend line will continue. I think the hands down, we provide better service than what they can get from either the diesel generation uh, you know, uh, solution that they've been using or the discom. So I, I, it's not a hard sell um, you know, once they understand the economics behind what we're selling. I think one of the basic concepts about why you have been successful of mini grid or solar power in those areas in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh flourished, I think is because of it got a kind of energy security, like many businesses want their uh, an, an, um, electricity from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m. I think Hus Power was able to provide that uh, confirmed power for, for those periods. That's why they have flourished and you got enough off takers. Yeah, I mean, you know, absolutely. Reliability is, is a key USP for us, a unique selling proposition, right? So reliability, quality of, of electricity, um, you know, ongoing day-to-day -day service. Those are all things that, and additional services that we provide, you know, such as, um, you know, appliance sales and financing through EMI and other things. So, you know, we're, we're and we're, we're localized, right? We're, we are part of the community that we serve. We hire, I think, I think the average is around seven people per plant, um, you know, for each one that we set up. We now operate, you know, 200 plus uh, mini grids in India alone. We're going to grow that to 350 probably by the end of this year. Um, you know, so we're, we're, we're members of that community. We're there for the long term, 20, 25 years, for the lifetime of the mini grid. You know, we're not just a, a state-owned enterprise that's trying to survive, right? And that's, you know, discoms lose, probably lose money on every rural connection that they make. We don't because we actually know how to serve that customer. We're from the communities that we're serving. It's a very different dynamic. And I think that customers that we serve realize that and they value the, the level of service that we provide. So currently you're operating in some parts of uh, Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. So you have plans to expand, go beyond these two states in India? So, absolutely. I mean, we're actually in other states already, Chhattisgarh, Maharashtra. I mean, you have planned or are you planning to? No, well, so it depends on what part of the business you're talking about, right? So appliance sales and financing, we're, we could be pan-India, right? Um, it doesn't have to just be serving our mini-grid customers. For uh, rooftop solar, which we're also, you know, is a big part of our business, we're already in multiple states, you know, uh, Maharashtra, Chhattisgarh, UP, Bihar. We'll be expanding into other states as well. Uh, and then as far as the mini-grid business is concerned, uh, there's certainly a potential for that. I think where we see the market going in India, which is very exciting, and I think, you know, if you look at the virtual net metering work that's going on, if you look at the way that discoms are now looking at... <coughs> if you look at the way that discoms are now looking at, at, at dividing into both rural, uh, urban discoms and rural discoms at the state level. You know, there's opportunities for public-private partnership between mini-grid developers and discoms that didn't exist before. Um, and I think that's super exciting. If, that, if we can prove that that model works, where the discom benefits, we benefit, and the customer benefits, if we can have that tripartite win-win-win, 
then that will allow our mini grid business to enter any place in India where that's an issue, and that's an issue everywhere, right? Um, so, you know, our our discom is going to be viable in rural India for the foreseeable future, and are they going to be able to integrate uh, renewables, distributed, you know, de decentralized renewable energy solutions into their grids in a, in the most cost effective way without partners like us? We think the answer is no, and we're looking, you know, we're very excited about partnering with discoms and other partners who will come in to, to help us prove this model and pilot it, that, you know, that public-private partnership that brings discoms together with mini, private sector mini-grid developers will be able to achieve multiple goals of the Indian government, rural livelihoods, you know, more, uh, you know, higher percentage of renewables in the grid, grid resiliency, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So the answer to your question right now is UP and Bihar will still be our focus, but we're looking uh, quite aggressively at how we can expand our footprint from the mini-grid perspective into other markets. And don't forget, we're also involved in the Kusum scheme, which has a, um, you know, a centralized uh, solarization of irrigation as well, not just uh, farmer by farmer. And I think that's also an opportunity for us to expand into to many other states. Yes, uh, William Veer, you know, we are in touch for the last, I think, two years and uh, you, we have followed each other's work. So, you know, uh, like two years back, I visited uh, Bihar's first village, Dharni, which was, uh, which was claimed to be Bihar's first solar village. There was one mini grid, but it failed after the grid electricity came to that village. Similarly, one DRE solution we saw in Barapita, that was a claim to be the first solar village of Odisha. That also failed after grid came or because of... Um, lack of the agencies involved to take the local communities into confidence or train them. Uh, so a lot of mini grids have failed in India and a lot of companies have also not been able to make it a profitable venture. So why you think that mini grid operations fail in India and why you think Husk Power thrived and make it a commercially viable model? I think you have to be careful about you know how you talk about the industry as a whole, right? Because the first generation of mini grids that were developed in India were largely state funded, right? And state managed. Um, and there were also some that were done by through CSR projects or other nonprofit organizations. And whether they're the state owned or state run projects or the ones that were done more through a CSR type of program, not for profit uh, type of model. Um, the operations and maintenance of those systems was never factored into that, nor was the, the need to look at the demand side, right? They, would ju they just looked at the supply side. And what we learned early on in Husk was that just because you build a mini grid doesn't mean that people are going to use your electricity. You really have to work hard on the demand side to make sure that there's enough demand. And that's why we have appliance sales and financing. It's why we have energy services. <coughs> And the, the state-run mini-grids, which were the first generation of mini-grids, didn't do that. And so you ended up with all of these failed projects all over rural India. Um, this is not a story confined to India alone. No, it's not. In fact, you see this repeating. It's, it's gonna, I think it's going to happen as well in, in many African countries. African is, you know, it's 50 countries, right? So you have many different approaches by different governments. Some governments are taking a similar approach that India did initially, uh, which was state, you know, state-funded, state-managed mini-grids. And our, our, our experience is that that doesn't usually end well uh, because the state is good at, at, at setting you know, a, a, f a framework for regulation and policy, but not necessarily executing against that framework, right? And so that's where the private sector really can come in and where Husk has excelled. I mean, what we've looked at, again, I've talked about this earlier, but you, know, you can't look at it just, just as, a, as a supply side issue. It's also a demand side issue. And you have to build a model, which we have, which is now EBITDA positive and profitable in, in, in India and in Nigeria, which is our second largest market. You know, we wouldn't have been able to do that unless we were nimble enough, agile enough, had uh, investment, we're investing in technology, IoT, AI, other things that allowed us to remotely manage and monitor these assets as well. All of those things combined led us to profitability. I don't think that you know that's going to ever be something that a government's going to do well. A government can do a lot of things, and they are obviously much needed. So they have different expertise, different yeah. I domains. mean, they're they're good at setting a market signal. We're good at following that market signal, right? That's a good combination, right? And so you know, I think you have to be careful when you talk about the mini grid industry in India. I think there is two two 
uh, distinct phases in the market, one that was state-led and one that was private sector-led. And, you know, Husk is not the only private sector mini-grid developer still standing in India. You have others like Tata, you have OMC Power, you know, so, uh, you know, this is a, it's, pro it's proven to be a, a it's proven to be a, a scalable model. So your websites, your works are uh, most about using artificial intelligence in your operations to increase output or maintenance. So can you elaborate on how you use artificial intelligence? So yeah, absolutely. So you know, one of the early things that Manoj, our CEO, uh, realized, and we've got a great VP of engineering and innovation, uh, is that you know, unless you can come up with a digital platform to manage all of these assets remotely the OPEX, the operation expense of, of, of running a fleet of hundreds of mini-grids or thousands of mini-grids, which is where we'll eventually end up. I and mean, we, we have a target of 5,000 mini-grids by the end of this decade, at, at least. This is the target of first power? Yeah, 5,000 mini-grids by 2030 is our target. Mm -hmm. Half of those would be in Africa, half probably in India. Um, and so you can't do that unless you have a very robust uh, digital interface between the, the operator and the asset, right? And so we've focused a lot and invested quite a bit on R&D to integrate IoT, AI into, into our mini grids so that we can manage them remotely and therefore scale. These are, you know, these are uh, expensive places to reach. You can't just send somebody um, on a whim to repair something. You know, you need to be able to uh, identify all kinds of things uh, about how those mini grids are operating on a remote basis before you decide what how you're going to solve it, right? And so, so far, AI we've used mostly on the supply side and really looking at um, uh, load forecasting and how to best manage load and reduce use of uh, diesel as a backup, which we still have to a small degree. Um, eventually, we'll be able to get rid of that. Um, but AI on the supply side, and now what we're doing is, is looking to uh, integrate uh, the demand side uh, using AI as well, uh, and really getting drilling down into the customer side of, of things and how to optimize their use of the, of the power from the mini grid. So I believe this artificial and digital interface is helping to maximize your output or uh, take care of any snag that develops and also uh, helping the customers also. How it is helping the customers? Well, it's optimizing the use of the mini grid, right? Which provides more reliability to the customers at the end of the day, right? So if we know what the demand forecast is, uh, or that we can then tweak our supply on a day-to-day -day basis to maximize how we're operating our mini grids so that it's more reliable in terms of its supply, but it's also, you know, um, reducing our OPEX costs as well, which we can pass on to the customer. So, you know, I think that there are different aspects of how it benefits the customer. Ultimately, at the end of the day, though, it's all about better, providing better service, right? And ensuring that it is 24-7 uptime or close, close to that. Um, so AI is just one of those, those tools that allows us to do that better. But the customers can also tackle, uh, uh, customers can also see the, like, uh, for part day level, they can track how much... Uh, energy they have consumed or what is the voltage they are getting from your mini grids? Yeah, so we, we, we all of our, 100% uh, of our customers pay through our mobile app. Um, so they can not only see what their day-to-day -day usage is, monitor usage, they can pay for, you know, we pay as a, it's a monthly fee each month. They can pay up front for the month ahead. They can also top up if they need to add additional power, you know, sometime during the month. Um, and they can monitor all of that remotely through that app. Um, the, the thing that is exci really exciting for me as well about what we're doing right now is we initially we built an e-commerce component into that app so that now our mini good customers can also purchase appliances uh, and access credit financing for those appliances through the app as well. But we're taking that a step further and, turn, and creating an, a... a um, an e-commerce platform for all of India, uh, potentially, rural India. It's very focused on the rural customer um, and looking to expand that to uh, rural customers, whether there are mini grid customers or are outside of the mini grid customer. So, you know, the digital aspect of our business, whether it's on the, the, the mini grid management side or on the e-commerce sales and financing side, it's, a, it's critical to what we are. I mean, in fact, 
you know, I think our, our CEO, Manoj, would probably argue that we're just as much, if not more, a technology company than we are an energy company. So last year, you got a lot of funding in through equity and debt loans, I think. So how exactly you want to use it? Would you like to expand beyond Africa and India? What is your main plan now? So, I mean, Africa is for sure the, the biggest opp opportunity as a, as a new market, right? Uh, Nigeria alone has 100 million people, 90 million people who live off-grid without any electricity. You know, it's a huge, it's the world's largest off-grid market, right? So, and the, the number, the amount of diesel generation used in Nigeria alone is mind-boggling. Um, so, you know, there's a huge growth potential there. Um, and we think that there are probably four to five other countries in, in uh, sub-Saharan Africa that we can achieve similar types of scale. Um, so Africa is going to be a huge growth engine for the mini-good industry as a whole, but also for Husk. Uh, in Asia, we've, we've certainly have been looking at other countries uh, in South and Southeast Asia. And we'll continue to explore that and, and see where we go from here. Of the, you mentioned the, the, the money that we raised in October of last year, that was about $100, $100 million, largest f financing in the mini-grid industry to date. 40% of that was equity, 60% of that was debt. You know, about two-thirds of that money will go to scaling in Africa. We're starting at a lower base, so we need more capital to ramp up more quickly. And the other, the remainder will go to scaling in India. So I think that'll lead us to about uh, 300,000 additional connections uh, as a result of that financing. And we'll get from where we were at that time of, of uh, fundraising from 200 mini grids to 1,600 mini grids uh, in terms of using those funds. So it's an 8x growth in the, in the fleet of mini grids, but also a huge jump in the number of connections uh, that we'll be providing. So we came across uh, during our talks uh, about uh, how you are operating, how Husk Power is operating and how it's making profitable. But what are the major challenges you see in operating in India that comes and that needs to be sorted about? Is it about confined to policies or some other conditions are also there? I think there's still a legacy mindset in India and in other countries, you know, um, uh, around, you know, what the energy electricity, more specifically, the electricity system of the future ought to look like. I think there's a lot of shift already happening. You've seen recently in India, the PM's uh, focus on rooftop solar and the role that decentralized renewable energy can play. Uh, we're, we're, India's way behind in terms of its uh, you know, goals on, on, on the off-grid component, right? Or not the off-grid, but the... <coughs> India is way behind in terms of the rooftop component of its solar ambitions, right? And I think there's a growing realization that uh, decentralized renewables are going to have to play a much more critical role in achieving the goals of both grid resilience, renewable percentage of renewables in the grid, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I think that 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 mind that mind sh uh, set shift is it's happening, but it's been a challenge to sort of get there. Um, but I think we're well on our way to, to seeing that become more, more of a reality. Um, I think also, you know, it's, it's state by state. You know, some state governments are much more open to uh, collaborating with the private sector than others. Uh, and I think that, you know, that's also a work in progress, right, where we're engaging with not only state governments, but also state-run companies like the DISCOMs to figure out what is the right model for a PPP. And how do we scale together that in a mutually beneficial way? So I think, you know, that legacy uh, is still quite strong in India, but it's starting to shift. I think it remains a challenge to, to, to you know, um, shift that inertia. So what are your main future plans now? So our major plans are growth. I mean, that, that, to put it simply, right? We started with 10 mini grids in 2018. We got to 200, we got to more than 200 and by 2023. So that was a 10x growth or let's say, you know, more or less 10x, 20x growth. We're now embarking on another 10x growth, right? So uh, at, while also entering additional uh, markets in Africa and potentially in Asia. So, you know, it's a growth story that we're, uh, we have ahead of us. Uh, but also an impact story, right? I think we uh, are already displacing a lot of or avoiding a lot of carbon by displacing diesel generation that will continue. We're monetizing that on the voluntary carbon market globally. The impact that we're making on lives and businesses 
is growing every day. So, you know, we'll grow our business, which will do well for us, but it'll also do good for the planet and for people, right? I think we're creating in energy infrastructure, decentralized energy infrastructure that's more resilient to climate shocks. We operate in communities that are the most vulnerable to those climate shocks. How do we help improve, you know, the energy infrastructure that serves those people so that they become more able to adapt to whatever is coming. Um, so I think we have a, a, it's a growth story, entering new markets, entering new businesses, scaling existing aspects of our business, but also really uh, being able to track and quantify the impact that we're making on, on human beings, right? And that, that ultimately is the mission of Husk Power. We're a social impact driven company. And at the end of the day, we want to better serve people and planet. And so, you know, I think we're, we found the right model. Um, now we just need to scale it as quickly as we can and make as, you know, as much impact as possible.